Sonic Rush, the first Sonic game I ever played. Back in elementary school, we'd occasionally be given magazines that advertised books, video games, and other junk kids liked. If I remember correctly, there was a checklist on the back where you could choose what you wanted out of the magazine. You'd fill out the relevant boxes, then beg your parents to give you the money needed to purchase the thing you wanted. I mostly remember the magazine having handheld video games, and that one How to Draw Pokemon book, which was in almost every issue now that I think about it. At some point, this one game showed up in the latest issue of the magazine, Sonic Rush. I had no idea what a Sonic Rush was, but the blue dude and purple thing on the cover looked kind of cool. So, I begged my dad to give me some money, then I turned in the magazine to my teacher with said money the next day. I think like a week afterwards, I got the game. After finishing school on that day, I got back home, did my homework, then popped the game in my DS. I was immediately hooked. I had never seen anything like it before. All the previous games I had played were just a bunch of slow-moving dudes going left to right. This blue guy, on the other hand, was going a bajillion miles per hour grinding on vines, running through loop-de-loops, bouncing on these red springy things. It was crazy. Because I was a brain-dead kid that didn't have too many games at the time, this quickly became my favorite game for a while. But yeah, this is a pretty timeless game for me. I like this game so much, I have three copies of it. Before I get into the game, I guess I can go over how I got each copy. Obviously, one of them is the one I got from the magazine. A few months after getting it though, I somehow lost it. I looked literally everywhere, but couldn't find the stupid cartridge. I was so crushed by this loss. I eventually accepted the fact that I'd never see it again, and moved on. I think a year afterwards, my dad eventually bought me another copy for my birthday. Who knew there were copies of it in the game section of my local Walmart at the time? Funny enough, a few weeks after getting that new copy, I found my old one. It turned out to be in one of the millions of pockets on a pair of cargo shorts I wore all the time. To think the game I had lost long ago was still pretty much with me at all times. Now that I think of it, that cartridge is pretty resilient. Those cargo shorts had been thrown in my washer and dryer hundreds of times, but it still played well, and there didn't seem to be any wear on the cartridge itself. Hell, I can't even tell which cartridge of the three is my original copy. Anyway, now I had two copies. One where the game was fully completed with S ranks in every stage, and the other I'd reset and replay whenever I felt like it. For the third copy, I just found it at a flea market a little over a year ago. Because I was a stupid kid that threw stuff away with no second thoughts back then, I had thrown away the DS cases for both of my Sonic Rush copies. The only thing I managed to not toss was the instruction booklet of my second copy. So, it and the two cartridges stayed in my Sonic Rush adventure case. When I saw the copy of Sonic Rush for $5 in that flea market, I just had to get it. Not only did I now have a third copy of Sonic Rush, but a proper home for the instruction booklet and the other two copies. So yeah, that's my Sonic Rush story. I think it's time we got into the actual game. When you start the game, you're immediately thrown into the first level, Leaf Storm, which is basically this game's Green Hill Zone. Here, you have the standard obstacles. Badniks, spikes, loops, springs, rails, hoops, etc. What makes this game different from previous 2D Sonics is the boost mechanic. This is the first 2D Sonic to actually have it. You can execute the boost by pressing Y. It lasts as long as you have this meter filled. To fill said meter, you can either kill badniks, get boost power-ups from item boxes and balloons, touch checkpoints, or do tricks. Doing tricks is pretty much the main method of filling the boost meter. You do these by spamming the R button while rail grinding, or the A and B buttons after bouncing off springs, or whenever some other obstacle launches you in the air. When you're launched, you have two extra movement options, an upward and side trick. You execute the upward trick by pressing up on the D-pad followed by R. It can be useful for reaching certain areas of the level you wouldn't be able to otherwise. The side trick can be executed by pressing, you guessed it, left or right on the D-pad followed by R. It can be used as an attack, but I mainly use it for cancelling my upward velocity to get back to ground quicker. Anyway, back to boosting. Obviously, boosting speeds you up. You're completely invincible during its execution, so if there's ever a line of enemies in front of you, boosting is a good way of killing them. Though, you can also do that with spin dashing. Yeah, that's right, spin dashing's in the game. It's honestly pretty useless considering you can boost. I can really only see someone using it if their meter is empty. Oh yeah, boosting can be used for one other thing entering special stages. There are a few of these things, known as special generators, littered throughout each stage in the game. When you jump into one, Sonic latches onto one of the handles. If you boost, Sonic will start spinning so fast that he opens a portal into another dimension. After boosting long enough, Sonic will go into the portal. Now you're in a special stage.
It's a half pipe you have to run through while getting rings and avoiding bombs. There are two checkpoints per special stage, one halfway into it and one at the end. They check how many rings you've collected, and if your count isn't greater than or equal to the required amount, you'll fail and be kicked out of the special stage. So, you want to collect as many rings as possible and avoid hitting the bombs at all costs. Anyway, once you've successfully passed the checkpoints, you'll get a Chaos Emerald. There are a total of 7 stages in Sonic Rush, and each one has an emerald to acquire. So, don't miss the chance to get one if you see a special generator. To digress for a bit, people like to say the halfpipe special stages are overused, and I do agree, but this is definitely the best iteration of the halfpipe. Sonic 2's is way too difficult because of Sonic's physics and Tails' delayed movements. Sonic 3D Blast for the Saturn has a cool looking halfpipe, but you actually have to play Sonic 3D Blast to get to them. I played Sonic 4 Episode 2 a long time ago on an iPad, and I remember the special stages being as mediocre as the game itself. Never played Sonic Heroes, but I've been told the special stages suck. I didn't play the 3DS version of Generations, but its special stages are the same as the ones in Heroes, just with better control apparently. The Sonic Rush special stages are the best because of how you move Sonic, with the stylus. Instead of holding a direction on the D-pad and waiting for Sonic to eventually move in said direction, you just tap the touchscreen with the stylus, and Sonic quickly snaps to that position. It makes maneuvering so much easier. The special stages for Sonic Colors DS are the same, but they're honestly pretty boring. Instead of collecting rings and avoiding bombs, you're collecting colored orbs. You loop through the stage a total of three times, each time collecting a different colored orb. The challenge here is that if you knock the other orbs when you're supposed to collect a certain color, you won't be able to collect them when their color is eventually required. It's just not that challenging. There's no way you can fail these special stages unless you intentionally go out of your way to knock out the wrong colored orbs. Anyway, back to Sonic Rush. There are two acts per zone, followed by a boss. At the end of each act and boss, the game tallies up your score, which factors in how fast you beat the stage, how many rings you had, and the bonuses you racked up while doing tricks. S rank is the highest you can achieve, but when I was younger, I used to think this was bad. I thought A ranks were the best, but I just kept getting S ranks and didn't understand why. I legit thought S ranks were bad because, you know, you get A's when you perform well on assignments in school, not S's. Also, the S rank icon was outlined in red, while A ranks were in blue. Red, to me, signified it was bad. So, until I started playing other games that had S rankings, I believed S ranks were a sign that you played the game badly. Here we go. Once we're done with Leaf Storm's two acts, we meet up with Eggman, who has some plan to become unstoppable, yada yada, we have to beat him. This first boss is the Egg Hammer. It'll bash its head onto the platform Sonic's on, and all you have to do is walk out of its way to avoid it. Once Eggman's cockpit is grounded, just jump on it and you deal damage to him. Located on the bottom screen is the boss's health bar. Eggman has 8 pegs of health, and honestly, that's way too much if you ask me. By default, the game puts you in normal mode, but you can switch to easy mode in the options menu. I could never tell how exactly the game was made easier other than the fact that it reduced the health of the bosses from 8 to 6. The bosses are far from difficult, they just take too long sometimes. It's mostly just waiting for Eggman to perform an attack that leaves him vulnerable. Each of the bosses have various attacks, and some of them don't actually give you an opening to attack. Because the actions of the bosses are seemingly random, they can actually perform these invincible attacks one after the other, dragging out the fight longer than it should. Of course, with two extra points of health, the boss will take even longer to beat. Because I'm an idiot, I didn't think to switch to easy mode, so I played through dragged out boss fights the entire playthrough. If you're trying to S rank the bosses, you just have to be lucky and hope they leave themselves vulnerable more frequently to beat them in time. Aside from the regular pound attack, Eggman also has like a super pound where he says the iconic and will instantly kill you if he lands the attack. It's still fairly easy to avoid, he just follows you a little longer than the other attack. His third attack is one he does at low health. Eggman will move to one side of the platform, drop the head of the robot on it, then sweep the stage multiple times. You have to jump over it, otherwise he'll knock you off the platform, instantly killing you. After beating him, Eggman flies away, and Sonic notices a blue gem in front of him. As he approaches it, a purple cat chick enveloped in flames snatches the gem, thanks Sonic for beating Eggman, then runs off. 
Sonic then meets up with Tails, lets him know Eggman's up to something, and tells him about the cat girl. Tails sticks with Sonic for the remainder of the adventure, not as some stupid AI that follows you and dies all the time, but as a navigator at the top of the screen. Yes! 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 And a cheerleader when you're fighting bosses at the bottom of the screen. On to stage 2, Water Palace. Not much to say about this stage other than it's a water level. When I first played this game, I was stuck here. I could not get past these levels because I kept drowning. In every Sonic game, if you're in water for too long, a countdown will begin and you will drown when it reaches zero. Because this was my first Sonic game, I had no idea how to circumvent this. Some of the underwater sections went on for a while too, so there was no way you could get through them fast enough. This was probably the first time I actually had to consult an instruction booklet for guidance. Sure enough, the booklet tells you there are air pockets littered throughout the underwater sections, and once a large bubble emerges, you just need to suck it up for more air. Once I figured that out, the level was pretty easy. After the two acts, we meet up with Eggman again, but for some reason, he has a grey mustache, a black suit, and refers to himself as Eggman Nega. This stage's boss is the... Egg Turtle? That looks nothing like a turtle. Anyway, this boss has three attacks. His main attack is one where he tries to hit you with the turtle's head, giving you a chance to jump and damage it. For his second attack, he chases you a bit and tries to crush you by slamming the belly of the turtle over you. His third attack is only executed at low health. The water level is lowered and the turtle settles down. The head detaches from its body and creeps up to nip Sonic. You have to get close enough to bait Eggman into attacking so he can leave his weak spot vulnerable. Aside from those attacks, there's not much else to say about this boss. Though, I am a little confused as to why Sonic suddenly doesn't need air bubbles to survive underwater anymore. After that, Sonic and Tails wonder why Eggman changed his name and outfit, and go to Tails' workshop to investigate. There, it's revealed there's a tear in the space-time continuum that's slowly expanding. If it gets large enough, the fabric of reality will become altered. Once they're done talking, they go to the third level, Egypt. Again, not much to say other than it's a level that has its own obstacles and enemies. Here, the game introduces rooms that lock you in until you defeat all enemies within it. You know, I haven't talked about this game's art style yet. It's a combination of great looking sprite art and 3D models. Sonic and Blaze are pretty much the only 3D assets during the zones, while the boss fights are entirely 3D, and I think that's pretty cool. This stage's boss is the Egg Scarab, probably my favorite boss in the game. Here, Eggman's robot somehow poops out giant spiked balls. He walks around with them and will eventually roll the balls towards you. What you have to do is wait for the balls to retract their spikes and knock them back to Eggman. He'll turn around thinking the ball will roll back into the robot's claws, completely unaware Sonic knocked the ball in the opposite direction. Once he's turned around, the ball will hit his weak spot. You don't want to knock the ball before he turns around, otherwise he'll just catch it and you'll have to wait for him to throw it again. Anyway, this is the only way to attack him, and I think that's really clever. Every other boss in the game requires you to jump into his weak spot except this one. When Eggman's at low health, he'll smarten up and jump over the ball. In that scenario, you just quickly run towards the ball again and hit it back in Eggman's direction. He's not smart enough to jump over it twice. His only other attack is one where he flies to the center of the stage and chucks the spiked balls at you. What you can do is spin dash, do a slight jump while holding down left or right, and when you land, you'll maintain the spin dash's initial velocity, which is pretty fast, but be running instead of rolling. With this speed, you'll always be on the edge of the screen, and the balls Eggman throws will never hit you. Though, there are occasions where Eggman just has aimbot and always throws the balls directly in front of you, requiring you to do a slight jump to avoid the explosion. All in all, really fun and interesting boss. After that, Sonic and Tails realize going to Egypt really didn't help with fixing the space-time continuum thing and go to Cream the Rabbit's house. Cream's mom is there, but not Cream herself. The mom says Cream went to town with some new purple friend of hers, and Sonic and Tails immediately know that she's referring to the purple cat chick. So, they pursue and enter the next stage, Night Carnival, because Carnival Night was already used in Sonic 3. It's a pretty festive stage. Bad nicks on pogo sticks, weird lights you can stand on, this spinny thing that used to piss me off if I hadn't built up enough speed, and so on. At one point, you'll reach this mechanism. When I was a kid, I was completely clueless as to how this worked. I remember actually running the timeout the first time I encountered it because I had no idea what to do. 
Eventually, I realized if you jumped on top of it and held down, it would charge up and launch you upwards. The longer you hold it down, the higher you go. I'm honestly not sure why I didn't think to do this back then. The obstacle was basically like those stupid spinning barrels from Carnival Night Zone and Sonic 3. What? All I had to do was move up and down? Up and down? What the f- This stage's boss is the... Egg Libra? What the hell is a Libra? I know it's one of those stupid zodiac signs, but is that what this is referring to? I don't even know what the zodiac sign means. The sign of Libra is the sign of justice, balance, and harmony. Oh, The boss is like a scale with Eggman on one end and an electric spike ball on the other. By default, the spike is always lower than Eggman. When you hit the ball, the scale changes, moving the ball up and Eggman down. It's like the scales of justice held by Lady Justice. This scale is always unbalanced, which could symbolize the fact that the space-time continuum is torn, and reality itself is unbalanced and not harmonious. It could also be like a representation of good versus evil. Man, I'm starting to sound like a high school English teacher. I'll shut up now. Anyway, like I said, the boss is like a scale. By default, Eggman's out of reach, and the only thing you can hit is this spiked ball. The ball sometimes shoots some electricity that lingers on the ground, so you want to avoid that. At lower health, the ball will slam onto the platform you're on and send these shockwaves you have to jump over. Most of the time, the ball is completely enveloped in electricity, meaning you can't attack it. Once the barrier is gone, you want to quickly jump and hit it. This will knock the scale over and bring Eggman down, giving you a chance to hit him. Once you do, the scale reverts back to its default orientation and the cycle repeats. Sometimes the scale tilts a bit, and in that scenario, you have to crouch down to avoid getting hit by the ball. When you hit Eggman, this little bug robot spawns. If you jump on it, you get launched pretty high. This is basically another way of attacking Eggman. If you're positioned properly, you can easily get another hit on him without having to wait for the ball to lose its barrier. Another pretty interesting boss. Okay, the next stage is... Wait, that's not a stage. There is a big rock. These boulders are blocking Sonic and Tails' path, so they have to make a detour. As they're about to leave, they hear a voice, and it's none other than Knuckles under the pile of rubble. Tails asks him how he ended up there, and Knuckles reveals it was because of a feline with an attitude, who was with Cream. They ask Knuckles where they went, but he's so infuriated that he runs off to smash some more rocks. So Sonic and Tails leave him be and continue on. The next stage is Huge Crisis, probably the silliest name for a Sonic stage I've ever seen. You're just on a giant ship fighting some unique looking badniks. Every stage in the game has those Sonic Hero-style badniks. You know, the ones with the pointed noses and giant grins. This is the only stage that doesn't feature them, which is interesting. Man, this music is so funky. This whole soundtrack is just amazing. I'll briefly play a few snippets of some tracks, but I implore you to listen to the whole soundtrack on your own. Anyway, on to the boss, which is the Egg Hammer again, but a slightly more annoying version. He has the same two pound attacks from before, but now has a third one where he does three slams in succession. He only does this at low health, and it can kind of trip you up if you were expecting him to do a single slam. His last attack is by far the most annoying move out of all the bosses in the game. He slithers away to the back of the ship and places his head on a pedestal. There, he's able to control some turrets that shoot these little rockets. Sometimes they come out very quickly, and sometimes they're very slow. Either way, it wastes so much time. That's why it's such an annoying move. Not because it's hard to avoid, but because it's so time-consuming. If you want to S-rank this boss, you better not miss any opening to attack, and hope to god Eggman doesn't do the turret attack twice in a row. Definitely one of the most annoying bosses in the game. After that stage, we finally catch up to Blaze and Cream. Sonic and Tails press Blaze about Eggman Nega and the space-time continuum. 
Blaze doesn't really say much, but explains it's her problem alone, then flies away with Cream. In an attempt to follow them, Sonic and Tails enter Altitude Limit, the next stage. This was probably the most irritating stage for me as a kid. There are just bottomless pits everywhere. One missed time to jump and you're dead. There just wasn't much room for error most of the time, whether it was navigating through these stupid badniks on a propelling platform, or jumping on these really small platforms that are slowly falling down to a bottomless pit. Now that I think about it, some of the level design in this game kind of sucks. It's clear the designers got lazy at points, like at the end of Water Palace Act 2. You have to stop dead in your tracks and jump on some fairly small moving platforms. If you fall, you're dead. There's a bottomless pit below you. At least they had the decency to have a block stop you from running off before that section, but it still seems lazy. We also have an instance like that at the end of Night Carnival Act 1. After swinging from some ropes, you have to quickly jump onto these small platforms that fall a split second after you land on them. Stuff like that isn't really difficult to navigate, but when you're a kid, those are like the hardest obstacles to overcome in a platformer. Tiny, spaced out platforms you can barely land on because you're psychologically tricking yourself into thinking it's harder than it really is. Have you ever had those moments in a platformer where you do a difficult jump, and you manage to make it, but at the same time you didn't think you would, so you kind of give up, but then you suddenly realize you actually succeeded, so you end up doing this thing where you keep jumping side to side even though you're on the platform already, and manage to fall off? That's the kind of behavior this level design incites, and it's kind of irritating, but I digress. All in all, Altitude Limit is an alright level, but it's probably my least favorite one. Actually, I want to talk about the music some more. Each one has vocals, and some even have lyrics. But most of the time, you can barely understand what they're saying. For Altitude Limit, you get this. Let's move on to the boss of this zone, the Egg Eagle. He has a total of 4 attacks. One that he does most often to waste your time is shooting you from a distance. He mainly shoots above you, but if you're far away, he tilts over, which can allow the bullets to hit you if you're grounded. So, you want to constantly move side to side so Eggman keeps himself evened out. Stay grounded, and the bullets will never touch you. For his next attack, he flies towards you, lands on the platform, and attempts to peck you. If he misses, he'll be vulnerable, allowing you to jump on his head. Another attack that leaves Eggman vulnerable is the one where he tries to jump on you. This is probably one of his more annoying attacks because it can be a little difficult to gauge how close he is to you. You have to get far enough away so that he can't hit you, but not too far, otherwise you won't be able to jump on his head in time. His final attack is pretty unique and introduces a mechanic we haven't seen before. Eggman will land on a side of the platform, then try to blow Sonic off with his propellers. To not get pushed off, you have to run towards him. Think you can just hold left or right on the D-pad like you normally do? No, you have to mash the A and B buttons. Try not to get tired when you do this, otherwise you'll get blown off and die. All in all, decent boss. After this, we get another cutscene. This time, Amy shows up. After a bit of awkwardness, Sonic asks Amy if Blaze had come by at some point. She says Blaze and Cream did in fact drop by, and that leads us to the final stage, Deadline. Not sure how Amy telling Sonic and Tails that leads them to an Eggman-shaped ship in space, but it's whatever. There are a couple of interesting things in this stage. You have these cool cannons that Sonic gets sucked into, occasional changes in gravity, hexagonal patterned floors that Sonic can run on, and these blades that allow you to switch between running on a floor or ceiling. We also have these rockets you can control. Up and down move it up and down, obviously, but so do left and right respectfully. I don't know why, but I always sucked at controlling these things when I was younger. The second act starts you off with one of these rockets. You have to ride it across this long, bottomless pit. I remember always dying here because I kept turning my rocket directly upward, where it would then blow up because there was a ceiling, then I'd fall to my death. I kind of want to talk about the special stages some more. Of course, each one gets progressively more difficult as you play through the game. So, since this is the final zone, this special stage will be the hardest to beat. Now, like I said before, using the stylus to control Sonic makes these stages pretty easy. However, since I'm using an emulator to record this gameplay, I have to use the mouse. I really suck at controlling Sonic this way. I managed to beat every special stage first try, but holy hell were the last two special stages scary. There were so many close calls because I just kept losing rings, or missing out on some entirely. Aside from just collecting rings scattered throughout the halfpipes, there are also these springs you can run into. 
When you do, you're launched up and are presented these little quick time events. It's just some numbers on the touch screen you have to touch in the proper order, smallest to largest. I remember thinking you had to touch each number individually when I was younger, but then realized you could just run the stylus against the screen and it was much more efficient. When completing these events, you're given rings. The faster you complete them, the more rings you're awarded. The later special stages have much faster quick time events, so I found myself screwing them up often because I wasn't fast enough with the mouse. You can also homing attack into flying badniks to get a couple rings. Don't know how Eggman's robots managed to get into the special stage dimension, but I won't question it. Anyway, that's pretty much it for the special stages. There are a couple other minor things I could mention, but they don't really need to be covered. Alright, on to the boss. Before that though, we get a cutscene. Turns out this Eggman Nega guy is indeed another Eggman, but from whatever dimension Blaze is from. Both Eggmans... Eggmen? I think I'll go with Eggmen. Both Eggmen were working together to get the Chaos and Soul Emeralds for world domination. Blaze wants to fight Nega, but Sonic does as well. This leads them to fight each other while Eggman Nega watches in the distance. So yeah, this is the boss, Blaze. She has only three attacks, a spin dash, homing attack, and one where she erects pillars of fire from the ground. To attack her, all you have to do is jump on her while she's not doing an attack. Once you get Blaze to one health, she and Sonic argue for a bit, then the most intense segment in the game begins. After nearly murdering Blaze, she finally opens up a bit. So far, Blaze has been pretty distant with us during our encounters. Everything's her responsibility, and only she can fix any of it. However, Sonic helps her realize there's value in having friends to rely on and help her out. Turns out this whole space-time continuum stuff is happening because the Soul Emeralds are forcing Blaze's world into Sonic's. The two worlds can't coexist in the same dimension, so if this isn't fixed, both worlds will probably cease to exist. So, assuring Blaze they can handle it, Sonic and Tails run off to stop Eggman Nega. I haven't mentioned this stuff to the side of Tails in the overworld. Obviously, this is the lives counter and the Chaos Emeralds you currently have. We also have this percentage. It's supposed to be how much Sonic and Blaze's worlds have intertwined. As you progress through the game, it increases. I never really liked this. It just seemed like an unnecessary statistic to have. It just has no significance and is only there for dramatic effect but I think the cutscenes talking about the increased chance of the worlds colliding is enough. I don't need some hard-coded value telling me that. It only increases every time you finish a zone, and never actually reaches 100%. It's not affected by how well you play, nor how fast you finish a level. It's literally there for no reason. That's like if Sonic Adventure had a Chaos Emerald counter in the pause menu or something. That game doesn't have optional special stages. You get the emeralds as the story progresses. So, it's obvious you're gonna have all of them by the end of the game, rendering an emerald counter useless and unnecessary. Anyway, on to Unknown, the final zone. Here, we're on top of what I believe is the ship from the overworld fighting Eggman Nega in a giant robot. His main attacks involve hitting the platform you're on and spreading these little shockwaves you have to jump over. To damage him, you have to jump on his head, as usual. How do we reach him though? Sometimes Eggman will move to the right side of the platform, then start punching it. Avoid the shockwaves, he'll eventually stop punching, and you'll be able to run up his arm, giving you a straight shot to his head. Eggman will attempt to shake you off if you're on his arm too long. To stay on his arm, you just have to crouch until he finishes shaking. Whenever his hands connect with the platform during an attack, they start blinking, indicating you can hit them. Hitting them will increase the chances of Eggman moving to the side of the platform, so you want to do this as often as possible to finish the fight faster. As the fight ensues, Eggman's attacks will execute faster, making them harder to avoid. You'll start doing some more attacks as well. One of them is a spammy laser, and the other ones are these stupid purple things. What they do is situate themselves above you and shoot out these purple lasers. Either multiple ones spawn and you have to maneuver your way between them as they phase in and out, or one will spawn and move around forcing you to stay between its two lasers. I never really liked these attacks because I could never tell how close I could actually get to the lasers. I remember eventually becoming a pro and avoiding these things effortlessly when I was a kid, but since it's been a while, I kind of struggled here. 
Anyway, once you get Eggman to one peg of health, he gets all riled up, then starts slamming the entire robot into the ship in a last-ditch effort to defeat Sonic. On the third slam, he stays in place. After a second or so passes, jump into his head and you'll finish him off. With Eggman Nega defeated, everyone gathers to congratulate Sonic, especially Amy. The game's not over though. We still have Blaze's side of the story to complete. After encountering Blaze at the end of Leaf Storm, she becomes playable. Blaze's story starts with her waking up in Sonic's world, not really knowing what happened, other than a mustached man stole the Soul Emeralds. She looks around for some clues to figure out what's going on, and ends up in the first stage, which is Night Carnival. Yeah, Blaze essentially goes through all the stages Sonic does, except in a different order. There's not too much to say about Blaze's side of the game since it's pretty much like Sonic's. I'll just go through all the small differences. Before I do that though, I have to mention something. The background of the Night Carnival stage has these flashy light-up signs of Sonic and Blaze, which I never really understood. Sure, I guess Sonic has signs up because he's a hero who saved this world several times, but what about Blaze? She's a character that just arrived here from another dimension. Why the hell would there be light-up signs for her here? Blaze fights regular Eggman instead of Eggman Nega like Sonic does. Every time you beat Eggman, you get one of the Soul Emeralds he stole. Why he always keeps one with him if there's a possibility of losing to Blaze, I don't know. Anyway, because of this, Blaze doesn't have to go through any special stages, and those special generators aren't in her levels. The bosses are the same, except Eggman gave his robots a girly color scheme. The music for each stage is also slightly altered. Blaze is noticeably slower than Sonic, and her directional tricks are different. Sonic's upward trick was just a slight upward boost, but Blaze rockets herself into the air like five times higher. Her side trick is an insanely quick dash. She travels a decent bit when doing this, but her horizontal velocity halts when the trick is over, so it's not as useful for maintaining speed like Sonic's. If you press and hold R after jumping, Blaze lights a fire under herself, allowing her to hover for a couple seconds. Sonic also performs an action when pressing R, but I never mentioned it because it's pretty useless. When you press R for Sonic and are near an enemy, you do the homing attack. There isn't much use for it since you can jump onto, spin dash, and boost through enemies. Levels don't even have chains of floating enemies like previous 3D Sonic games to chain homing attacks, so not even the level design promotes the use of this mechanic. When you aren't near an enemy, Sonic just gives himself a slight horizontal boost. It acts similar to the side trick because of this, just slightly slower. This can be pretty useful, especially if you're airborne from something that wasn't a spring, but I didn't think it was noteworthy enough. Tails acts as Sonic's navigator and cheerleader, while Cream and her Chow Cheese play the same role for Blaze's side of the story. It's a funny clash of personalities. Blaze is a loner who's serious all the time, while Cream is super extroverted and friendly. As the story progresses, Cream slowly makes her way into Blaze's heart, and eventually makes her friendlier and less cold. In Sonic's story, he and Tails go to the final zone to stop Eggman Nega. But for Blaze, regular Eggman kidnaps Cream, which is the reason she goes to the final zone. The storylines are happening in parallel, so how are Blaze and Sonic fighting the Eggman in the final zone? Are they fighting on two different ships? It's really unclear. Anyway, I think that's pretty much all the differences between Sonic and Blaze's gameplay. If there are other differences, they're probably so trivial they aren't even worth noting. So, we beat both Sonic and Blaze's storylines. Are we done with the game? Nope. If you go back to the character select, you'll be greeted by... With the Soul Emeralds back in Blaze's possession, the space-time continuum stuff seems to have stopped, but she isn't really sure how to get back to her world. While she's pondering, the Eggmen jump her. Sonic shows up to stop them, but they run off. Blaze tells Sonic the Soul Emeralds lost their power, and I assume that's because the Eggman drained them while beating her up. Sonic tells her it's no big deal, the other characters show up to cheer Blaze on, and it becomes a whole, you can do it kind of thing. The Soul Emeralds regain their energy through the power of friendship. 
and we get this super cool cutscene of Sonic and Blaze transforming into their super forms. Now the real final battle begins. Not sure where these guys are, but I assume it's the convergence between Sonic and Blaze's dimensions. We start off with Super Sonic. Before fighting Eggman, you start off avoiding asteroids and lasers, collecting rings along the way. You use the D-pad to fly in all 8 directions, and Y to perform an invincible dash. Eventually, you gain on Eggman and start fighting him. He has 4 attacks. His first, and most annoying attack, is one where he shoots these floating mine things that shoot lasers in 4 directions while rotating. It's the most annoying because the only way to hit Eggman is to bounce his projectiles back at him. These things move all over the place, so it's a bit tricky to line up your shot. His second attack is one where he shoots these green energy blasts. Because they go in a straight line, it's much easier to bounce these back into Eggman. Those are the only two attacks you can use to damage him. For his third attack, he swings an energy sword at you twice, and his last attack, he flies into the background and shoots missiles. This is the only attack that can actually make you lose rings if you're hit. After three hits, Eggman fumbles back, goes into this machine, and out comes Eggman Nega's version of the robot. Now we have to fight as Blaze. Instead of bouncing projectiles into Nega, Blaze has to shoot a fireball, which you do by pressing A. She has to charge up the attack for a bit, so you can't just spam it and hope it lands. Eggman Nega only has three attacks. One where he slashes you with his claws, one where he shoots an arm at you, and one where he goes into the background and somehow tears through the fabric of reality to suck Blaze in. After three hits, it goes back to Sonic vs Eggman, then Blaze again, then back to Sonic. After that, the fight's over. Sonic and Blaze combine their power to defeat the two Eggmen, there's an explosion, and I get an easy... B? Dang, that's the first time I got less than an A in this playthrough. Oh well. Anyway, Sonic and Blaze get all sentimental, say their goodbyes, the dimensions close up, and they're sent back to their worlds. Credits roll, and we get a little post credit scene, where Sonic falls from the sky, lands right next to Cream, whispers something to her, probably about Blaze, and Cream and Cheese get all happy. Alright, now the game is over. What a nostalgia trip. I love this game. I wasn't bored at all during this playthrough. I guess because this was a game I played all the time at a young age, it became one of those timeless classics that never get boring no matter how many times I replay it. You could throw me on a deserted island with this game, and I'd probably never get tired of it. I remember wishing this game had a sequel, and guess what? It did. Sonic Rush Adventure. Unfortunately, it wasn't as good. When it comes to sequels in the modern era, you can't just rehash the same game with a different story. You have to throw something new in there so it's more unique. Sometimes it works out, and sometimes it doesn't. What was Sonic Rush Adventure's new gimmick? Ocean travel. Yup, to get to new zones, you had to travel in things like jet skis, ships, submarines, and this thing. It was fun for what it was, and the regular gameplay was pretty much just like Sonic Rush. It just wasn't as memorable as the first one for some reason. So, is Sonic Rush the best Sonic game ever made? No, but I will say it's the second best. Yup, this is the second best Sonic game ever made. If I had to rate it, I'd give it a 9 out of 10.